against every ordinance of God. Certainly against worship, against the seven-day cycle of worship and rest, against the ordinances of, um, that God has appointed in our, in our worship, but also against things that are more common to, to all people, like uh, multiplying and filling the earth. People are opposed to that. Uh, against marriage. And even against marital fidelity, actually celebrating sexual perversion and deviation. We've, we've gone so far in our hatred and rebellion against God that we actually harm and destroy our own selves. Against the ownership of private property, against honoring authority, and even against our own body and our God-given gender. There is a war against God that spills over to the destruction of ourselves. Nevertheless, God has promised that despite our fall from his original calling, he would bring forth out of our ruined race, by his grace alone, a godly people who would fill the whole earth. What he originally said we were to do. From the time of the fall, he promised to bring forth of us a son, a son from us, who would do his will to restore his people. A son to do all that was required to restore them. God sent prophets who are given divine messages, oracles of God, about the son who would come, and they told us many things about him. He called a people out to become a nation for him. They were to be a depository for his truth. Like he spoke the word to them and gave them the oracles of God and they had the scriptures and they were to be a, a, a receptacle of God's prophecies, his truth, all uh, given responsibility to, to maintain the word of God. They were to walk in his ways and to exhibit what it's like to be God's people and to serve him. They were to maintain the rituals that he appointed that would show by the, those shadows the way of salvation that he was going to bring forth. They were to be the ones through whom that son of promise was to come. And he made all of that clear that these people that he had brought out and preserved, that that was what their role was. And one of those oracles written a thousand years ago before he came, the oracle that we looked at last week declared that when he came into the world, he would declare this. This is back in Hebrews 10, 5 through 7. We looked at last week. Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. A body for what? A body to be the sacrifice that God does require. 
in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do your will, O God. And it says he takes away that first in order to establish the second. Like the old covenant with all the shadows is replaced because that's not really, that, that, that's not really what God required. That was just pictures of what he required. God, God required it to be a picture, but it wasn't what was given to actually bring forth the salvation. That was always the son that was to come. And so he says, I've come. I've come to do that very thing. This oracle, oracle showed what he would do, with what the ritual sacrifices revealed, what they showed must be done, an atonement given for sin by a holy priest. He would do the will of God and actually make atonement to reconcile sinners to God. The passage we're looking at today Hebrews 10, 11 through 18, was written to assure us that Jesus was successful in what he set out to do. I came to do your will, O God. I came to be all that is required for my people that they might be saved. He, he has accomplished what was given him to do. He came to do the will of God, and he did it. Listen to these wonderful words of hope. It's from Hebrews 10, 11 through 18. This is the word of God. And every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. From that time, waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified But the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us, for after he had said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. Then he adds, their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. Now where there is remission of these, there is no longer an offering for sin. And there we end the reading of God's holy word. May he add his blessing to his word. It's very important for us to know that Jesus was successful in doing the will of God for our salvation. All that God required to restore sinners to God. It's very important because anyone who wishes to be restored to God must trust in what he did. Or they cannot be restored to God. There's no other way. So we need to be confident that he was successful in what he did before the Father, what the Father sent him to do. This passage, Hebrews 10, 11 through 18, brings to a climax everything that we have seen about Jesus in Hebrews from the very first verse. It sums everything up to prepare for the practical section of Hebrews that is to follow. I'm going to say a little bit more about that a little bit later. That begins in 1019 with the word, therefore. That's where there's a transition in this book from telling us all that Jesus did and then telling us how we should respond to it. We have seen that in these first 10 chapters, 10 and a half chapters, we've seen how Jesus was the Son of God sent from heaven to be the great apostle and high priest that we need. The apostle and high priest that we trust in to reconcile us to God. In Hebrews 1.1 through 2.18, we saw that he is God's ultimate revelation to us of what man is supposed to be. In these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. He is the Son God sent from heaven in our flesh, to be the captain of our salvation, the one who goes ahead of us that we follow after. He became flesh and he leads the way to life. He says, follow me. In Hebrews 3, 1 through 4, 16, we saw that he is the great apostle of our faith, that unlike Moses, who is part of the house, he is the one who actually builds the house as the the apostle of God. 
He restores us as God's people under God's blessing forever, bringing us into God's rest that he has for us where everything has been done and we're able to come and enjoy God and live in communion with him. In Hebrews 5, 1 through 6, 12, we saw how he was the man of true compassion who gave himself in order that he might save us. And we were warned against being detached and uninterested in him. It was a very solemn warning that was given there. And we were told that we need to likewise be merciful to, to one another. If we, if we know him, it's an evidence that we really know him that we have embraced him. And then in Hebrews 6, 13 through 8, 6, we saw him as the priest after the order of Melchizedek. An unusual kind of priest from what they were familiar with because a priest who is also a king and a priest who is without beginning of life or end of days and yet one who did come born of a woman in the flesh. He was the eternal God come from heaven coming in our flesh to be a priest and king. He will reign forever, keeping us secure in God's blessing forever. He's a priest that ever lives to make intercession for us, a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who also reigns as king to destroy all of our enemies. We looked at Psalm 110, of course, in connection with that. Then we came to the section we're in now, Hebrews 8, 7 through 10, 18, where we're going today, and we have seen how he is superior to the priests of old because he is the one who actually carries out what the ritual sacrifices only signified. By him, we are truly pardoned and sanctified. He is the true priest who comes before the very, the very dwelling of God, the very throne of God, representing us, and who brings us into God's true sanctuary where we have communion with God, not in a building, but where we actually have communion with God by his spirit and are in fact the dwelling place of God. Jesus is the, the head of that church, that tabernacle, that uh, he is the true sacrifice that takes away our sin, not just a shadow of that. He's the one that actually made atonement and he is the one who doesn't burn incense to God but whose prayers are what the incense represented, a sweet savor to God that is acceptable to him that God hears and receives. So we don't have the building with the priests and all the washings and all the sacrifices of atonement and the altar and all of these things, the incense. We now have Christ. And today, in 10, 11 through 18, which completes this section of Hebrews, not only the section that we're in now, the subsection, but also all the way back to chapter 1, that great division of the, the doctrinal section of Hebrews, we're given assurance that he was successful in accomplishing all the Father sent him to do. We can count on him to secure God's blessing of salvation for all who put their trust in him. He was sure to save so the son's success, let's look at different ways that it is seen. The son's success is seen by his sitting down after he offered his one offering. His sitting shows that he finished his work of offering sacrifice for sin. The purpose of a priest's offering, as we saw earlier in Hebrews, was to be a sacrifice for sin, to take away sin. We're reminded again in verse 11 that the priest under the old covenant stood that they, and they, they offered daily sacrifices that could never take away sin. Taking away sin is the goal of a priest's work, but yet they could not actually take away sin. Verse 11, though, says, it, it, it spells that out. It says, and every priest stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. So they were appointed to keep on offering their sacrifices, to keep on doing it, because they were just symbolic of what was needed. That is what they were appointed for. It wasn't wrong for them to do that. That's what they were appointed to do. So they were to keep doing them over and over and over because they weren't the real thing. 
And everybody should know that because they were done over and over. If they worked, you wouldn't have to keep doing them. Jesus is set in sharp contrast with that because his offering was successful. It accomplished reconciliation. It says, but this man, verse 12, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So instead of repeatedly offering, he offered one true sacrifice, and then he sat down because he finished his work. That's what we have right at the beginning of Hebrews, isn't it? That after he purged our sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. He sat because his offering was successful in taking away the sin of those it was offered for. Verse 14 says so. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. To perfect them is to take away their sin adequately so that they can come to God. They are called those who are being sanctified because they together are the bride of Christ who is now, having come to Christ, is now being prepared for fellowship and communion with him as her husband when the great marriage supper of the Lamb comes at the, at the last day. We're betrothed to him. We're already his bride, his betrothed, and we're waiting for the great day when we will be presented to him to live in his house in glory forever and ever in the Father's house. And we're going through preparation for that. Like, like the women did in Esther where they were, they were prepared to come before the king. His offering has taken away our sin, taken away the guilt of the bride, so that she has been fully pardoned and accepted and made righteous before God. He has taken away her sin forever, and now she is being prepared for his house of glory. Jesus will never have to make another offering for our sins. He has completed that work. He sat down concerning that work. He has other work to do, but as far as that work is concerned, there's nothing more to be done. There's no more that can be done. He can sit down. If he were like the priest of old, he would have to keep on offering. He'd have to keep on standing. He wouldn't be able to ever finish. But you see, the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin, but Jesus gave himself, the Lamb of God, to take away the sin of the world. His work was successful. It took away our sins. He sat down. But notice further, it is noted that he sat down at the Father's right hand. We have seen that the high priest went into the tabernacle that was made with men's hands, that only represented God's true dwelling place. Tabernacle in heaven. It was a copy of the real one. But Jesus is said to have gone in before the Father and to have sat down in His presence, even at His right hand, in a place where there is all authority. He, as not the Son of God, only, but as the Son of God who is ma became man, as our mediator in our flesh, is seated at the right hand of God in heaven. This shows that the Father accepted his sacrifice. If it were not so, there's no way that he would have been allowed to sit at the right hand as our mediator if his sacrifice had failed. Because he had a sufficient offering, as it said in one place in Hebrew, something, something to offer, then he, to take away our sins, then the Father said to him, sit at my right hand. He would not have done that if Jesus had not been successful, if the offering had failed. Now, this is meant to give you additional encouragement that Jesus not only sat down believing that his work was done, but that the Father also received him into his presence to sit down in his very presence at his right hand because the Father agreed that the son's work had completed, that he had completed what was necessary to take away our sin by his offering. This is written that we who have fled to Jesus, we who have trusted in him, might have strong consolation and good hope that our sins are pardoned. Offering of Jesus, our great high priest, has been received and approved. Our sins are taken away. What if the whole world actually believed that and trusted in that, what a difference it would make. What if the whole church believed that and actually trusted in that? What a difference it would make in the church. The son's success is seen further in that he is waiting for his enemies to be made his footstool. 
This is shown in verse 13. I'll read from verse 12 to give you the context. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. So we have Jesus sitting. We have him sitting at the right hand and we have him waiting. His waiting also shows us that his sacrifice was successful. The great aim of Jesus' work is this thing that is described here, that all of his enemies would be made his footstool. We looked at it in Psalm 110 when we were there. That they will be brought under his feet, as it is sometimes says. What does that mean? Everything, it means that everything must be made visibly subservient to him. You see, right now, everything is subservient to him and that he's sovereign over all things. And everything happens according to his will. All things happen according to what he has ordained and planned. But everything is certainly not visibly subservient to him at this point. Since the world was created, it has all been under his sovereign hand. The Bible tells us he works all things out to the counsel of his will. Even the wicked are subservient to his purposes, but they're not visibly subservient. They're not consciously subservient to him as bowing down to his sovereign majesty and awe before him. The point is that everything must be brought to that place and he is waiting for that time. Now, what is it going to look like when everything is brought under him? When everything is brought under his feet, first of all, God's original purpose for creation that I talked about before is going to be accomplished. It's going to be achieved. It's going to be realized. What I mentioned in the introduction, the earth will be filled with devoted worshipers of God. There won't be anything but devoted worshipers of God in the whole world. Nothing but worshipers of God who love God as their God and who live under his bountiful provision that he gives them. And it will be a bountiful provision. It will be a rich provision. They will leave, live in sweet harmony with each other and with the creation itself and with God their father and with Jesus their husband. Yes, the wind and the waves, the sun and the moon, the animals, the trees, all things will be brought under him as our prince, our, the Lord of glory, the King of kings. Since dominion was taken away from us when we fell, we had dominion over creation when we were created. That dominion is restored to Christ. And it's going to be visibly restored. We saw something of it when he was here and he calmed the wind and the waves and he healed sicknesses and he did all of these things. He's going to do that to the fullest extent when he comes in his glory. But best of all, in that day, we who have fled to Christ for refuge will be perfected in holiness. Every last vestige of sin will be completely taken away so that we will serve him in a world of perfect worship and of perfect love. And that is glorious beyond all imagination. That is what it will look like in the world when we are brought to our appointed place under his feet. But what about the wicked and those who do not repent and those who do not come to Christ? Satan, the demons, and all those who remained in rebellion against God and never trusted in Christ, they will be cast into the place that Jesus called repeatedly the place of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus warned his hearers about this repeatedly during his ministry on earth and so he continues to warn them through the pages of Scripture when those Scriptures are faithfully preached. When they are brought under his feet, it will look very different than when we who have come to him for salvation are brought under his feet. You see, we were enemies too that were reconciled by his grace and brought under his feet as those who are volunteers who are willingly serve him. These other ones will be brought under him in a craving way. It's, uh, they'll be brought under him subdued. For us, it will be all that our sanctified desires have craved that will be brought to pass. For the wicked, it will be that they're taken away from the world to the outer darkness 
where they will be forever and ever condemned. Their unsanctified desires, that they, the things that they dreaded, will all be brought to them. So everything will be brought under the feet of King Jesus. The fact that after he offered his offering, Jesus sat down to wait for this, shows that he knows his offering was successful. He couldn't have no expectation that all things would be put under his feet as the head of the church if his offering for our sins failed because we would still be condemned and there would be no hope that there would be this new heaven and the new earth where righteousness dwells. There could be no expectation of such an outcome, but he has such an expectation. Why does he have it? We're, we're told that he is waiting for this glorious outcome when everything is brought into its proper place because he knows that his offering accomplished what it was designed to accomplish. We have confidence in his offering then. Why? Because he does. So if you say, oh, I don't know about it. Well, Jesus has confidence in his offering, so you can have full confidence in it because he knows. Wait with him for the blessed outcome. He knows that this outcome of the new heaven and new earth is going to come, so you can know it too. Take heart, dear Christian. Jesus has completed his work as our priest to atone for our sin. He has been accepted, and he is waiting now with us until God's name is hallowed, until God's kingdom comes and Satan's kingdom is destroyed, until God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. He is going to bring that to pass. His kingdom will come because his offering has taken away his people's sins and they are received as those who are being prepared for glory and he will not fail to bring them to glory. The son's success is also seen in the benefits of his offering that are promised to us by God the Holy Spirit. Notice how verse 15 says, but the Holy Spirit also witnesses to us. So we've seen in many ways, the last week and this week, the testimony of Jesus Christ and the things that were done. But now we also have the testimony of the Holy Spirit about the sacrifice of Christ. We saw how the Son recognizes that His sacrifice removed our sins, that He sat down at the Father's right hand, waiting until His enemies were made His footstool, because He knows that His sacrifice was accepted. But now, to give additional confirmation, we have the testimony of the Holy Spirit that Jesus' sacrifice was sufficient. The Spirit's testimony is that once Jesus' work is complete, the promises of the new covenant will come into effect. In other words, what will show that Jesus' work was accepted according to the Holy Spirit? I will make a new covenant with you, and it will have these provisions that will be yours. The Spirit gave this testimony centuries before Christ came of what would happen when Jesus finished his work of our salvation. Indeed, when the Spirit, when the Holy Spirit says in Jeremiah, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. What do the words after those days refer to? The words after those days refer to the time after the old covenant dispensation is ended. Okay, when all those sacrifices and ceremonies and things are ended, that's after those days. Those days when my people didn't do what I asked them to do. I set them up to be this for me and I had to chasten them. I had to remove them. I restored them in my mercy. After those days of that kind of thing, that, that old covenant are ended. The new covenant was established over the time of Christ's ministry. If you try to look and say, okay, when was the covenant the new covenant actually established. You, you know, maybe you could say at the Lord's table when he says, this is the new covenant in my blood. And he declares, you know, that's certainly a time when it's very much um, declared. But it's not like it's a boom, it's done thing. The new covenant was established over the time of Christ's ministry. It began with the preaching of John. It's, the beginning, it's called the beginning of the gospel in Mark. It was furthered in the coming of Christ in the flesh in his public ministry where he declared that the time was at hand and he showed us that he was the one who had authority by his signs and wonders and casting out Satan. 
It was solemnly enacted and confirmed in and by his death when he actually shed his blood to atone for our sins and that blood was accepted. It was further confirmed by his resurrection when the Father showed that he had indeed received and accepted what he did. It was still further ratified and established when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost when the gospel was preached and people began to go forth and the Israel really began to go forth and proclaim the good news to the nations. And it was fully confirmed by the ministry of the apostles and the establishment of New Testament gospel worship and the bringing of an end in 70 AD to the temple and all of its sacrifices and ceremonies. All of that, you see, there was a, a fullness that was brought in. God gave his people a transitional time when they realized that there was a change from the old covenant to the new covenant. People didn't all of a sudden understand all of that. Even the apostles, they had to figure out, okay, do we still have to circumcise the nations? They, were, they, were, they had to work through all of those things. The Spirit's witness, though, from ancient time was that the new covenant promises would become the benefit of every believer after Jesus had accomplished his saving work and been accepted, that had been accepted as a sacrifice for our sins because his sacrifice was accepted. And that was fulfilled after Jesus completed his work. That is the testimony of the Holy Spirit. And what are those covenant promises that the Holy Spirit said would be ours and that are ours after Christ completed his work? Well, let's just review them briefly as they are mentioned here. First, there is the covenant promise of verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts and in their minds I will write them. And who especially does that work, by the way? It is the Holy Spirit, isn't it? This speaks of the revelation of the Spirit of God and of his ways that enable, so that we are enabled with our heart and mind to truly know God and to know and embrace his saving way. Okay, they're writing the law in our hearts, that he shines the light of the truth into our heart. He makes himself and his ways known to us and gives us both the desire and the ability to walk in his ways. He shows us even the way of the gospel. It's the law, when it, when it speaks of the law in the Old Testament, it's talking about the whole teaching of God, right? The Torah. Um, when, when we see his laws with true knowledge, with our mind and our heart, it means that the light of his truth gets into our soul, as it were. Now, we'll be looking at this in detail in our afternoon service. Interestingly, so often these things run together, don't they? But there is a, but suffice it to say, there is a great deal of difference between knowing, for example, the commandment that says, you shall not steal without the light of the Holy Spirit. Anybody can understand what that means. But to know that without the light of the Holy Spirit versus knowing it, when, knowing it as by the Spirit, where you see what a selfish grasping wretch you are in comparison to the generosity of God and what he calls us to be and the graciousness of our Lord Jesus so that you cry out to him for mercy and deliverance. There's a difference, isn't there? You can go on, oh, I never stole anything. I'm good. But when the Holy Spirit shines this light on your heart, that becomes a whole nother matter, doesn't it? Wow, I'm so selfish. Here's my Lord who's so gracious and giving and here I am. But you see, we don't despair because he came to save us from our sins. He's offered a sacrifice that takes away. So we come to him and we rejoice because we can grow and we can become all. And that's just one commandment. We could do that with all of When the Holy Spirit writes God's law in your heart, you're compelled to go to Jesus. You, you won't do anything else but go to Jesus because you, when the law is written on your heart, you know that there's no other way. You, you don't dream about, oh, I can fix this up. I, I, I can take care of it. No, there, there, there's none of that whatsoever. The Spirit certainly did His work in a powerful way at Pentecost when the house of Israel and the house of Judah began to realize that they crucified their own Messiah. Not all of them did. But there were quite a few people. There were the 3,000 there that realized that through Peter's preaching. 
This outpouring of the Spirit was done in even a visible way with signs and wonders to show that, hey, this is the fulfillment of what was told in the Old Testament that the Spirit would be poured out when Messiah came and successfully reconciled us to God. The Spirit continues to do this work in all the elect. Not in that that highly visible way, but He continues to, to bring us to that place where we see that we need a Savior. It is most evident in the New Covenant, though it was done in the Old Covenant as well. You know, there were, certainly people had that uh, working of the Spirit. But it simply became more widespread under the New Covenant. Compare Israel in the wilderness when they came out of Egypt with the early church under persecution when they came out of the world. And you see the difference. Like there were leaders in Israel. There was Joshua and Caleb and Moses and people that were filled with the Spirit and so on. But many of the people, we're told God was not pleased with them. It's more of a wide spread sweeping thing that we have when we see the persecuted church in the New Testament. It's a, it's a different kind of a story there. The second promise that is brought to fullness on account of Jesus' completed offering for our sins is the forgiveness of sins. In verse 17, the Spirit says, their sins and their lawless deeds I'll remember no more. So that's the second thing. Now, again, there certainly was forgiveness in the Old Testament. Ask David. <laughs> I mean, who could have written anything better than Psalm 32 and Psalm 51 about forgiveness? Um, Ask Solomon all the things that he did. He wrote Ecclesiastes. He knew about the restoration of God. Ask Manasseh, the worst king that Israel ever had, who repented and was received, received forgiveness. But it was not until Jesus came and offered himself for our sin, as we've seen in Hebrews, that real atonement was made for the church. You might say that individuals who believed then as now were all forgiven. They were all forgiven in the Old Testament. But the whole church as a body, as the bride of Christ, one bride with many members, was not actually forgiven and justified in a sense until Jesus came and offered himself for our sins. That was when the work was accomplished. I don't mean that people weren't justified before. There was a a promise and they trusted in the future. But if Jesus had not done what he did on the cross, no one could be justified. There was a time in history when we went from not having that provision to having that provision. And so there was a change in the sense of our reception of the forgiveness that God promises. Therefore, after he offered himself for the remission of our sins, we're able to fully proclaim forgiveness in a way that we couldn't before it was done. We can show sinners the marvelous thing that God did to save us from our sins. We now proclaim Jesus crucified. We declare the gospel to the nations and it changed things because now the nations, by the working of God's spirit, come to this salvation. They didn't come to the shadows. The spirit gives a greater assurance to us than they had of old. And we're able to come to God with greater boldness and confidence than they were able to come. As those who are fully cleansed by Christ, we're able to cry out by the spirit of God, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father because our sins are forgiven. There is such a confidence and and, an assurance of our acceptance, an assurance that we really are forgiven when we see what God did through His Son. We're able to see the glory of God. We're able to see the mercy of God more fully. We're able to know Him and to accept His holiness and His justice that we would otherwise be terrified to accept. We'd be frightened to come near and really see how holy and just he is. Now we can see more and more of his justice because when we see more and more of his justice, we see more and more of his forgiveness in Christ. We see more and more of the full provision that he made and we give glory to him. We don't have to run away and hide from his holiness and justice. We come to him boldly now with confidence. We're able to see God's righteousness and wisdom that brought all of this to pass. So once again, the Spirit promised that this blessing would be ours. 
upon the completion of Christ's atoning work in, a, in the new covenant way that there would be forgiveness. I'll remember their sins no more. And he has delivered that promise to all who believe. We know ourselves to be a marvelously forgiven people in the New Testament. Indeed, there are low times in the church when the Lord withdraws our comfort. There are times when he turns our children over to apostasy and they perish and the church declines. But there is still assurance of forgiveness in those who know Christ. There are also times when we may, in our individual life, lack personal assurance. And it doesn't mean that we are not converted. But as believers, we never lack the assurance that there is forgiveness with God, that he has forgiven his bride. We're just not sometimes sure maybe we're not a part of the bride. Maybe because of our sin that we have not repented of or other matters that may cause us to doubt. But we don't doubt that his bride has been redeemed by his blood. So the Spirit's witness that our Lord would give us a new heart and remember our sins no more once Jesus finished his work on the cross proved that his work on the cross was successful. He has accomplished our redemption. So now lastly, I want you to consider that the son's success means that there is no longer an offering for sin. Or you could say, to put it more in what we've been looking at, that uh, the fact that there's no more offering for sin shows that he, his sacrifice was successful. God has taken away the offerings for sin. Verse 18 says, Now where there is remission of these, that is the forgiveness of sins, remission of sins, forgiveness of sins, there is no longer an offering for sin. When it says that there's no longer an offering for sin, it means that there is no longer an offering that is appointed by God. I mean, people sometimes do offerings for sin today, don't they? And they did when, after Jesus came. They sometimes did. Uh, people do unauthorized offerings based on the authority and advice of misguided and sometimes greedy church leaders. Churches claim, some churches claim to offer up the body of Christ for sin again and again. But they cannot do anything that God is not authorized. So they're not really offering anything up to God for sin. It's not an offering for sin. There's no more. God hasn't authorized it. If he had not appointed their rituals when their offerings for sin, then their offerings for sin are not offerings for sin at all. I don't know what they are, but they're not offerings for sin because God didn't appoint them. He doesn't receive them. Some even collect money or services of various kinds as an offering for sin. But when God's word tells us that there's no longer an offering for sin. These are only offerings for sin in the imagination of those who offer them. They're not really offerings for sin. In Hebrews, the offerings referred to are actually offerings, though, that there are no more of, are actually offerings that God did appoint, aren't they? But that are now removed. I mean, it speaks to both of them. There's no more offering for sin. There's no more pretended offerings that are not, never even authorized. And the authorized offerings of the old covenant are no more. Why? Because there's been a change. Christ has been received. His sacrifice has been accepted. So uh, you see in, 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 in Hebrews, um, the, the ones that God did, did appoint are removed. Of course, there are still offerings that we give of worship and service and tithes and offerings, but there are no more offerings for sin. Those are not offerings for sin. That's what we're talking about here. Nothing is authorized in that way. The rest of the epistle to the Hebrews tells us what to do instead of offering for sins. The people in the old covenant were occupied with offerings for sin, with cleansings and offerings and all of these things. So the rest of Hebrews that we're going to be looking at in future weeks, it tells us now how to what we're to do instead of offering for sin. And how would you put that in a few words? It tells us to trust in Jesus Christ instead of that. To live by faith in his finished work. And it tells us what that looks like. Now, no more offering for sin. See, this, this ends that whole section because we've got an offering for sin. So now what do we do? We live in a new way. We come to God in a new way by faith. And that's what we're going to look at. At this point in Hebrews, we have that transition I mentioned before from teaching about what Christ did for us 
to declaring how we ought to respond to what he did. This is something that we find in many of the letters of the New Testament. There is a doctrinal section, we may say, and then a practical section. That's one of the ways we sometimes describe it. One very familiar example is in the epistle to the Romans. Paul tells us how righteousness is obtained by faith, by the grace of God in the first 11 chapters. And then when you get to chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that I've just been talking about for the previous 11 chapters, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And the rest of the letter focuses on our reasonable service to God. So you have the doctrinal section and then the practical section. You have a similar transition in Ephesians at chapter 4. It's very common. And here it is in Hebrews at 1019. This is sometimes referred to as a change from the indicative, where we're told what God did, where it's declared to us, to the imperative, where we're commanded of what we are to do in response to what God did. So in Hebrews, we have this transition from the indicative to the imperative at Hebrews 10, 19, marked by the word, therefore. And from that point on, the focus is on how we ought to respond to what we have seen in the first ten and a half chapters. Now, it's not surprising, then, that the imperative part of Hebrews is essentially a call to live by faith. When the first ten and a half chapters is about Christ and what he has done to save us, we would expect, then, that the response to that is that we should have faith in him. The Old Testament certainly was a time to live by faith as well, as we will see very largely in Hebrews 11. But it was a time of offerings and of trusting God to provide what we now trust in. The message of Hebrews is that now God has provided, so the New Testament is contrasted from the Old in particular as a time of faith. So much so that when Paul writes to the Galatians, he refers to the old covenant in contrast is the time before faith came. He says, now that faith has come, this is how things are different. Certainly they live by faith. Again, Hebrews 11. But there's a contrast. They did not have the finished work of Christ to trust in. Now we do. Lord willing, we're going to see what it looks like to live by faith in the weeks to come. In summary, we'll see that it means that we rely on Christ and the work that he did to save us. We rely on him for full forgiveness, and we rely on him to transform us so that we put off the old man with his sinful passions and desires, and we put on the new man who's renewed in his likeness after the image of God. The great summation of the first ten and a half chapters of Hebrews is that Jesus has done the will of God when it comes to being a priest offering himself to atone for our sins. Hallelujah, he has done it. There is no more offering for sin because there is no need for any more offering for sin. Now we honor God, not by bringing many offerings for sin to him, but by trusting in the offering that he has provided in such a way that that trust radically reshapes the way we think about God and the way we live. That is, so that Christ reshapes us because we trust in him. We go to our Savior, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We live by faith. Please stand, and let's ask him to help us do that. O Lord our God, how we praise you and thank you for what Jesus Christ has accomplished We praise you that he has made an offering for sin that takes away the sin of the world. He has satisfied your justice with his offering for his bride. We thank you, O Lord, that after he came, then there is now forgiveness to proclaim in a new and fresh way that was only anticipated before he came. Now we can say, here it is. This is it. This is what was done. And we know that this should have a profound effect in our lives. It should have a profound effect in the way that we even look at our ongoing sin. That we no longer look at it as something that we're kind of helpless about. 
but that we come to you, O Lord, and we uh, we appeal to you and we look to you for for the forgiveness, but we look to you to change us and deliver us. We don't have to pretend like it's not really there or that we're really okay or all the ways that we pretend. We can keep on coming and living before Christ and, and rejoicing in your work in our lives by your Spirit. Father, we thank you for for what you have done. It's marvelous to us to realize that you really did come into this world to bear shame for the wrongs that we had done. How could it ever be thought that the Creator would do that for the creature that had rebelled against him, whose rebellion was so wretched and treasonous that it calls for eternal punishment in the lake of fire? How could it be that you would come and bear that punishment in order to redeem us and set us free? Truly, O Lord, you have revealed your grace in marvelous ways. And we pray that we would grow in our understanding and our delight of that grace in such a way that we would be a very transformed and different people. We certainly do have a long way to go. But Father, we are thankful that you are at work in us and that Jesus is confident that the time is going to come when everything will be brought under his feet. And Father, we are confident that that will come because he is confident that it will come. He knows that he sat down and he's waiting for it. And so, Lord, we are resting with him and waiting for it also. Father, work in us that strong faith and assurance and confidence that will cause us to live in the way that your people ought to live. Oh Lord, thank you so much for the blessing of the Holy Spirit and the work that the Spirit does to write your law in our heart so that we can grow up into that and also to bring us into full forgiveness of sins that we can, by faith, Know that we are forgiven as those who have trusted in Christ. The Spirit gifts us with faith in order that we might believe and that we might know and be assured. Father, continue your work in your church. Cause it to spread. Cause it to spread to people maybe even in this room that don't know you. And cause it to go to those that are outside that we may see many people come to know the delightful things of the gospel and its grace that they would come to know our delightful Savior. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. Let's receive now the blessing of our God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.